everyone, and welcome to this exciting episode of OPG Live. They're all exciting episodes. <laughs> I feel like I say that every single time. So for to change things up, this is not going to be an exciting episode. It's going to be an extremely boring episode of OPG Live. I am professional photographer Ian Plant. I am the moderator, Leah Zayner. Now, some of you may be wondering what happened to Lilia. I don't know. She's not here today. <laughs> Our new, uh, my new co-host is Leia, and uh, I, you know she's she's basically Lilia, but with slightly less long hair, and she's got red in her hair. So just you know, imagine everything else being the same. I, you know, some of our viewers like continuity, so this is going to really freak them out. Uh, in today's exciting episode of OPG Live, I am going to discuss my upcoming trip to the Puna, which is a high altitude desert in Argentina. I'm going down there in just a few days to witness the total solar eclipse on July 2nd. Or at least I hope I'm going to see a total solar eclipse on July 2nd, weather permitting. But I will be there. The solar eclipse is only going to be visible uh, basically uh, in some places on the Pacific Ocean and then uh, in Chile and Argentina before the eclipse, the sun sets. Uh, and then it won't be visible anywhere else on Earth. So there's really only a limited opportunity to see this eclipse, and you've got to be in a narrow band of totality, which is about 30 or 40 miles across, as the sun zips over Chile and Argentina around sunset, and then no one else is going to be able to see it. So I'm hoping to be one of the lucky few that will be gathered in this very remote part of the Argentina desert to witness this amazing event. This will be my second total solar eclipse. I saw the one that we had just a few years ago. Uh, that, for that one, I backpacked into the wilds of Wyoming, into the Wind River Mountains, and I spent uh, four days in the backcountry, uh, hiked about 40 miles with about 40 pounds on my back, and got bitten by 40,000 mosquitoes. So I'm hoping that this adventure will have a lot less mosquitoes. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I thought I would uh, show you some of my photos from this incredibly beautiful desert area in Argentina today before we turn this over to live Q&A so I can answer your questions. But before we get started with that, I think Leah has a few announcements to make. Absolutely. So today we are sponsored by Tamron. So Tamron. Tamron. Thank <laughs> gotta I say it right. I practiced this before and <laughs> here it is. Tamron is sponsoring our live event today. We also are offering a free download. It's a downloadable guide called Seven Ways to Immediately Improve Your Photography. So if you click the banner below the chat box or if you're watching on Facebook, you're going to find that link in the description. And this guide is going to cover frame construction, composition techniques, your gear, even the weather, which Ian already you mentioned so sometimes that'll get you I'll you'll find about, that yeah. in that downloadable guide so take advantage all right fantastic it sounds like a really interesting guide and uh, with any luck we'll go over a number of photo tips and techniques today so I'm hoping that I can give you even more ways to help you improve your photography in addition to <laughs> the download actually I don't know what the seven tips are in the download so I might be a little redundant but that's okay <laughs> it's it's a good idea to get some of these lessons over and over again a little bit of positive reinforcement so that they sink in I know I need it said to me at least 10, 10 or 20 times before I understand it so well, why don't we dive in then into some of the photos that I have taken in previous trips to the Puna region in Argentina. Now, this is a high altitude desert. Most people are familiar with the Puna's more famous cousin, which is the Atacama Desert in Chile. And there's also a high altitude desert in Bolivia. The Argentina Puna is very similar to both of those desert areas. Actually, this is just kind of one big high altitude desert area. And I think the distinctions between these three deserts are really more based on the political divisions between the three countries than anything else. Uh, the, the three regions are very similar, and some of the terrain you'll see in one area, you'll see in the other uh, two areas as well. What is unique about this desert area is the altitude. The average altitude for this area is about 14,000 feet. So it's the kind of place that will literally take your breath away. Uh, it, it'll figuratively take your breath away because it's so beautiful and stark and remote, uh, but it's also going to cause you to be panting with exertion uh, just walking a few steps away from the car. So uh, being at that high of an altitude can be a lot of fun, and uh, it certainly adds an element of euphoria to your photo adventures. Now, I've been to the Puna twice in the past few years, and uh, each time that I go there, I am just amazed at how beautiful it is. Now, those of us living in the U.S., we're a little spoiled because of the desert southwest, which contains some of the most diverse 
varied and beautiful desert on the planet. There's really not a lot of places around the world where you can find desert, desert scenery that's as good as the American Southwest. And certainly you don't have all of that diversity jam-packed into one small area. But the Puna does give the American Southwest a run for its money. It doesn't have the really incredible sandstone formations that you'll find in places like Arizona or Utah. But it's got a lot of unique features that I have seen nowhere else on Earth. So it's a place that I like to go back to as many times as I can and explore. Every time I go, I find something different. So let's dive into the photos right now. And uh, the first photo I'm going to share, this is just one of the many uh, rock formations that I found in the Puna. This is a sandstone obelisk. I think it's literally called the obelisk. Uh, El Obelisco. My, my Spanish is horrible, so I apologize to any Spanish speakers in our audience today. I do the very best I can, but as I often say when I'm visiting Spanish-speaking countries, uh, uh, mi español no bueno. So I know and I'm murdering that even. So <laughs> my Spanish is very bad. But this, uh, this is a sandstone obelisk that uh, I photographed a few years ago. And this is in the desert area that's outside the, uh, the town of Cafayate, which is a w part of a wine producing region. So some of the wines that you can find in this area are, are excellent. This is one of the top wine producing regions in the country. So I go there for the photography, I stay for the wine. Uh, and this is outside the town of Cafayate, not to be confused with the town of Calafate, which is much, much farther south in the Patagonia region. So Cafayate is a beautiful town in the high uh, desert mountains, and you can get some great wines while you're there. So for this particular photograph, I made this photograph at sunset so that there was some strong, colorful light on the obelisk. I waited for the moment when most of my foreground was in shadow, so the obelisk kind of stood out. It's more visually prominent in the composition. And the weather was really critical, as is with all of my landscape shots. I'm always praying for some clouds in the sky. I don't want too many clouds that are going to block where the sun's going down or coming up. But if you've got some clouds in the sky, it adds some texture to the otherwise blank sky, and it can add a lot of color and shape to the sky as well, making it a more important part of the overall composition. So having that big storm cloud behind the sandstone feature was really critical to the success of this composition. And it's what I'm always waiting for when I'm making landscape photos, those really dramatic stormy skies. And that's one thing that's really kind of unique about this area, the Puna is that even though it's a desert and it's you know, technically very, very dry, that's what it means to be a desert, this high altitude is mixing with these, uh, these storms that are passing over from the Pacific Ocean. And even though most of the rain doesn't touch the ground, that's why the Puna itself is so dry, a lot of times you get these big storm clouds that build up in the sky. So it's really dramatic. You see it raining in the sky. You'll see what is called Virgo, which are clouds of rain that never touches the ground. Uh, but the area itself stays very, very dry. So most of that rain is falling on the other side of the mountains. And so these storm clouds build up. And you can get really dramatic sunsets and sunrises as a result. So that's something I'm always looking forward to when I go down to this area. And I'm hoping that I get some dramatic clouds when I go visit again for the eclipse, except for when the actual eclipse happens. And I'm hoping for some clear skies. <laughs> so, and just remember, at any point, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them related to the photos that I have. And if you do, Leah will stop me and ask the questions. If there are questions that are unrelated to the photos, we'll save those for the Q&A session at the end of the live event. So going back in to the photos, we are zooming in. There we go. Uh, one other thing I love about the Puna is because you're so far away from civilization most of the time, when you do have clear skies, you get incredible stars. And some of the places where I stay are literally hundreds of miles away from any sort of major human habitation. So the stars at night, especially when you're at that higher elevation, there's no pollution, uh, very clear air when the storms aren't building up, you can get some incredible stargazing opportunities. And this is something I like to uh, mix in with my photography. So I took this particular photo in an area that's known as the pumice stone field. And it, you know this is kind of a, a name that doesn't really do the place justice. By field, uh, I mean an area that's probably about 40 miles across. It's a giant field. And by pumice stone, I'm not talking about those little 
stones that you might have at your home that you've picked up as a curio from some trip somewhere, or those, uh, I guess some people use pumice stones for cleaning or yeah. for you know exfoliating. We're not talking about that. We're talking about these giant stone obelisks that are as tall as 40 or 50 feet high. This beautiful white rock obelisks covering this field that's about 40 miles across. So this is an immense area, and it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. You have all these white stones rising up out of these black volcanic sands, and it's really dramatic. We do have one question that has come right. through here from Julian, and it's a pretty general question, but since you're talking about desert, mm -hmm. what lenses will work best for desert landscapes? Uh, well, thank you, Julian. That's a, that's a good question. Uh, it's, a, it's a rather general question <laughs> because the lens that's going to work best is the lens that is best for the subject that, that you're photographing, whatever it is you want to photograph. You can use a variety of lenses, and it also depends on the kind of desert scenery you're, you're in. Like, so, for example, if you're in sand dunes, uh, you can use wide-angle lenses to capture the sweep of the landscape, or you can use shorter telephoto lenses to zoom in on some of the patterns, the alternating layers of light and shadow on distant dune features. And it's the same thing with pretty much any other type of desert environment. So me, personally, I'm a wide-angle guy. I like working with wide-angle lenses, and I'm looking to capture the grand sweeping landscape, so I'm often trying to get close to an interesting foreground object and then having some scenery in the background and then hopefully some dramatic stormy clouds in the sky as well. So that's my preferred lens is to work with a wide angle zoom, but often I'll reach for my longer lenses like a mid range zoom like a 24 to 70 or a short telephoto like a 70 to 200 to capture more distant landscape features or to try to capture a more intimate part of the landscape. So for this particular photo of the uh, pumice stone field at night, I was shooting with an ultra wide angle lens in 11 to 24. And so I was very wide. That allowed me to capture an extremely wide field of view. So lots and lots of stars. And I took this on the edge of twilight when there was still just a little bit of ambient glow in the sky, lighting up the landscape. You can see that there's a few clouds in the sky here drifting over, which I think adds an interesting element, and then you've got the stars in the sky above. So if you want to get photos of the stars, you've got to wait until the sky gets dark enough so you can see the stars. Uh, they have to be brighter than the sky around it. And also you have to use a high ISO, uh, a wide open aperture, and a relatively long exposure to capture the stars. So often I'll be shooting at ISO 3200, I'll be at f4 or f2.8. Uh, you know, I often use my Tamron 15 to 30 2.8 lens when I'm doing uh, star exposures because uh, that lets in a little bit more light than some of my other lenses. Alas, I dropped that lens just a few days ago while photographing up on Lake Superior and it's all scratched up now. Uh, and I destroyed the camera that was attached to it because it went underwater. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, so I, I'm not sure if I'm gonna bring that lens with me on the, the, the next trip I'm taking. I would like to have it for some star work, but the scratches on the front of the lens might make it difficult to get a good image. Um, and usually what I'm doing is shooting wide, shooting at f2.8 if I can, ISO 3200, and my exposures are often 20 seconds or 30 seconds long. That's enough to capture the light coming from the stars, so you can actually record the, uh, the stars as little pinpoints. But if you go longer than that, the stars are moving across the sky relative to our position on Earth. Actually, it's the Earth spinning. Uh, and as it spins, the, if you do exposures longer than 30 seconds, you'll start getting trails of light, these little streaks of light as the stars uh, cross the, uh, the sky. So if you don't want trails, if you want pinpoints, you've got to keep your exposure to 30 seconds or less. Okay, diving back into the photos, we need some sort of cool zooming in effect whenever I say that so that we can <laughs> like literally dive into the photos. So here's another photo of the pumice stone field. Uh, just to give you an idea of what the scenery can be like here. It's really, it's the kind of place where you could easily get lost in it. Uh, actually, what I do is when I go out there, I just typically wander around. It's getting back after dark to the vehicle. That's the tricky part. Uh, but eventually you hit the edge of the pumice stone field and then it's just a matter of figuring out whether you need to go left or go right to get back to the car. Um, but the great thing about this, the, the white pumice stone uh, captures the light of the sky. It's very reflective. So if the sky at sunset goes purple or pink, a lot of that color gets captured by that white rock reflected by it. So it takes on the color of the sky. So 
you can work with this reflective light. You know, this is the sort of thing you'll see when you're photographing with reflections. Obviously, water is very reflective, so you can, you can mirror the colors of the sky and the landscape down below. But there's a lot of other surfaces like ice or certain types of rock that are very reflective and will capture that light from the sky. Uh, white sand dunes in um, uh, New Mexico is another place because the sand is white there. It just glows with the color of sky at sunrise and sunset. So it can be really interesting to find a way to bring the colors in the sky together with the colors in the foreground. So diving back in, this is known as the Labyrinth Desert, also known as the Red Desert or the Devil's Desert. Uh, it's got many names. It is a beautiful desert area outside of the border town of Toler Grande. Uh, which is this tiny little dusty little town in it's seemingly in the middle of nowhere. It's really, really remote. It's a fun place to hang out. Uh, and uh, it's got a lot of character at the town itself. It's a lot of fun walking around there and taking pictures in the town. But I really love the desert around it. You get this cracked mud desert, this red clay desert. I wouldn't want to be there after a rainstorm because all of that clay will turn into mud. Uh, but what happens is when the mud dries in the desert heat, it dries very fast. The, the, the mud uh, turns to clay, and as it's expanding in the heat, it cracks. And you get a lot of interesting patterns that you can use as a dramatic foreground for your landscape photos. So here, once again, I went very wide. I included some interesting uh, clay, cracked clay formations as my foreground. I've got a sandstone mound in the background, uh, and then the clouds in the sky to complete the composition. Uh, this sounds like a pretty good time for this next question okay. here. Uh, also, if you have more questions, you can keep filling them in in the chat box below the screen where you're watching. Uh, this question is from Denise, and she wants to know, how do you protect your camera from the heat and the sand? Hi, Denise. Um, so you should never ask a professional photographer how they protect their cameras, because the answer is I do a really bad job <laughs> protecting my cameras. As I just told you, I destroyed a camera and lens uh, just three days ago, and it was just stupid. I affixed it to my ball head on my tripod. I didn't turn the little knob enough, and so as I put the tripod over my shoulder, the camera fell off and dropped into the stream uh, below the waterfall that I was photographing. And uh, so it's toast. Uh, but actually, I find that I don't have any problems in the desert. So the, the main challenges in the desert, you know, first of all, the heat chances are is not really going to do anything to damage your equipment. If you're in a really, really hot area, like if you go to Ethiopia's Danakil Desert, and I suppose if you leave your camera out you know, on a hot rock in the middle of the day, maybe it'll melt. I don't know. I've never seen anything like that happen. But I, I've never really had heat uh, cause any problems with my camera gear. Uh, usually it's cold that causes the problems. Uh, and I've been to some pretty hot places. You know, I went to the Danakil Desert in Ethiopia, which is arguably the hottest place on Earth. And while I was there, I climbed up to a volcano to photograph the volcano, which was even hotter. Um, and uh, I didn't have any problems with my equipment. I bet if I threw the camera into the lava, there might be some problems. But <laughs> uh, So you know, one other concern, especially if you're working in an area with sand, is getting sand into your equipment. And usually this is only an issue if uh, one of two things happen. You know, first of all, if it's windy and there's a lot of sand in the air, uh, you can get sand getting into your equipment, especially if you're changing lenses. So what I do is if I have to change lenses in a sandstorm, I always turn away from the wind. So I'm blocking with my back and then I put on a jacket and I will open up the jacket and change the lens underneath the jacket. That maximizes the protection, minimizes the chance of sand getting inside the camera. Uh, but even then, you're still likely to get sand working its way into the focusing ring or the zoom ring on your camera. And I found, for the most part, that it's not likely to actually damage your equipment. Every now and then, I'll get some grain of sand stuck somewhere. And it might cause it difficulty if I'm trying to zoom or focus. But almost always, eventually, that that speck of sand will grind up or work its way out. So it's actually been pretty rare that I've had some sort of damage because of sand, though it can happen. So you want to be careful. The other thing that, where you can get sand into your equipment is if you're really dumb and you throw your camera on the ground. One of the biggest mistakes I see people make is that they'll put their camera bag on the ground uh, on a slightly breezy day, and they'll leave it open, and they'll walk away to take pictures, and they come back, and their open camera bag is just full of sand. So. What you should do, definitely, whenever you're working in a sandy environment, unless, it's, unless there's no wind at all, if you throw your camera bag down, make sure to close it up when you're done so you don't get sand 
uh, being brought in by the wind there. So that's the biggest concern when you're working in a desert environment is sand, and it's actually pretty manageable as long as you're careful. Okay? All right, fantastic question. Thank yeah, you. Let's thank you. zoom back into the photo, dive in. We still don't have that cool effect yet. <laughs> I'm looking at you guys in the producer's box. <laughs> come on, come up with something. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that I love the storminess of the Puna. And this is one of the most dramatic storms I've ever seen there. One of the scariest looking storms. And you can see in this photo, once again, this is the pumice stone field. These are some of the pumice stones rising from that black sand that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so you can see that it's really dramatic, really stark having that black versus that white color. But this storm was one of the most wicked storms I've ever seen. The, chi the sky turned all sorts of weird colors. Like a lot of people living in the Med Midwest will tell you about tornado storms coming in where the sky turns green. Well, this was at sunset. I saw the sky turn purple, uh, uh, orange, yellow, and blue all at the same time. So it was really dramatic lighting. This is not a photo that's been, where the colors have been manipulated. This is really how it looked to the eye. It was very dramatic. And you can see that virga, that rain that's coming down from the sky that doesn't touch the ground. So it creates this wispy uh, tentacle effect. It looks like some sort of giant alien monster that's come down to Earth and its tentacles are coming down to scoop up uh, hapless human victims down below for whatever it is the aliens want to do with the people. So it kind of looks like something like that, I suppose. I think this metaphor is getting off track, so I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to leave it behind altogether. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can see that that's the Virga. That's the rain that's coming down that's not uh, actually touching the ground. And it, it just creates this really dramatic effect. So it's something that I'm always looking to capture when I'm making photos. So the storminess of the Puna is what I love about it the most. You can get that storminess in the American Southwest certain times of the year. In the summer, you get what is known as the summer monsoon. So you've got this warm, moist air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico, and it works its way up into Arizona and Utah. I've seen it go as far north as like Wyoming. And what happens is in the afternoons, you get these giant storm clouds that build up. And for landscape photography in the desert, that's really a great time to be there. Even though the heat is unbearable, those storms are incredibly photogenic. So it's something I'm always looking for. I'm always looking for ways to incorporate stormy weather into my landscape photography. The stormier, the better. Now, David has a question All here right. coming in as well. Did you use a filter on this image? Thanks for that question. Uh, no, I did not use a filter on this image. So one type of filter that you might use when you're making photos at sunrise or sunset is known as a graduated neutral density filter, which will darken the sky uh, so that when you've got a bright sunset sky, for example, and the landscape beneath is in shadow, this will balance your exposure. Now, for this particular shot, the light was actually pretty balanced to begin with. So the sky was, was pretty dark. It wasn't really one of those bright, colorful sunset skies. So it balanced pretty well with the landscape beneath. I was able to capture everything with a single exposure. And then when you're processing the image, you can darken the sky a little bit and brighten the landscape to achieve that look that you would get with a graduated neutral density filter. But if you can capture all of the tones in a single image, if your camera's got enough dynamic range to get the range from light to dark in an image, you don't need to use the graduated filter. You could just take a single exposure and then mix the light uh, selective darkening and brightening adjustments to the photo. So the grad filters, I used grad filters for years. I stopped using them a few years ago, and instead I prefer to do exposure blending if I need to. Um, the reason for that is that the grad filters uh, are often difficult it's difficult to get a natural look. As you bring the grad filter down over the sky, sometimes it darkens the sky too much. Sometimes it doesn't darken it enough. You need to bring a bunch of filters of different strengths to find the one that best matches what you need for the scene. And if you pull that filter down over anything sticking up into the sky, like mountains in the background or trees or anything like that, those are going to go darker as well. So the look's not quite as natural. So I recommend that people learn how to do exposure blending. It's actually pretty easy in Adobe Lightroom, which is what most people are using to manage and process their raw files. Uh, you can do a simple merge to HDR exposure blend. So what you do is when you're in the field, if you've got a bright sunset sky and a dark shadowed uh, foreground, you take an exposure that's optimized for the sky. You take another exposure that's op optimized for the darker uh, foreground, so it's a little bit brighter than the sky exposure. And then you just run them through the merged HDR program in Lightroom, and it outputs a merged uh, raw file 
that captures all the detail that you need for your photo. So it's actually very simple. Okay. Uh, well, there's a little follow-up question right. from Paul Schneider about this photo. Hi, Paul. Hey, where was your focus point? Ah, my focus point in this photo. So this is the question I get every live event. How do you focus for landscape, or where did you focus, or anything like that? And uh, so this forces us to start talking about things called hyperfocal distance and depth of field. These are very complicated uh, things that most people don't understand, and it's kind of it could easily derail our conversation. So what I do is I recommend if you really want to understand all of this better, check out my course, Focusing for Landscape Photography, which is available on the OPG shop. And I do believe that the guys in the producer booth have got a, no, they don't have it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> they, they made this special display to show whenever we got the question about focusing and they don't have it. Shame, <laughs> shame on you. That's OK. If you go to the OPG shop, you'll see my course, Focusing for Landscape Photography. Also, so, make sure to follow the social media <laughs> channels as well. I'm sure the Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, you might find some links there as yes. well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But so that's a very, very long answer. And it's obviously an answer that could get much more complex if we dive into this. So basically, where I focused was uh, I didn't focus on the closest objects in the scene. So the closest part of the scene would have been the black sand in the foreground. I didn't focus on the farthest objects in the scene, which would have been the mountains in the background. I focused somewhere in between to optimize my depth of field. So for this shot, I probably would have ended up focusing on those first pumice stone uh, rocks that you see in the middle of the composition. And that would have been roughly where my hyperfocal distance point would need to be to optimize depth of field from near to far to make sure everything in the scene was in focus. And then I had to stop down to a small aperture like f11 or f16 to extend that zone of apparent sharp focus to make sure everything is covered from near to far. This is a very complex area that's very confusing. A lot of photographers We'll use hyperfocal distance, depth of field, and aperture to control the zone of focus. And increasingly, photographers are using something called focus stacking, which involves taking uh, different shots where everything is the same. You don't really change the exposure or the composition. You just change your focus point, and then you blend those together on the computer to make sure everything is sharp from near to far. Once again, very complicated topic. Check out Focusing for Landscape Photography on the OPG shop if you want to learn more. And one more. This is okay. an either or. <laughs> this is from Molly, and she's asking, Hi, Molly. are you shooting both, this is a chance for me to learn, raw or is it R-A-W? It's, it's raw. Raw. Yes. Are you shooting both raw and JPEG or just raw? Fun fact, it, it's, most people misspell it and uh, spell it capital R, capital A, capital W, thinking it's an acronym, but it's not. It just stands for raw. So it's actually just, you don't have to capitalize any of it. <laughs> uh, it, it. It's just a file that has the raw data that is collected by the sensor. It hasn't been manipulated by a computer or anything like that. So that gives you more leeway when you're processing your images. So for me, I'm just shooting raw. I'm not shooting JPEG at all. Some people, when they're new to raw, will also shoot JPEG because it gives them a reference file. So the difference between the two JPEG is a uh, computer manipulated file. It's a smaller compressed file, uh, so it has less data, and therefore there's less detail in the file. Uh, it's going to look as sharp. It's not really going to look like it's of less quality unless you start making edits to the file, and then you might see a diminishment of image quality. So JPEG is great if you are like a photojournalist and you don't have time to edit your files. Um, but RAW is really preferred for most photographers because it gives you more leeway in the editing stage. So when you take your RAW file into, say, for example, Adobe Lightroom, you can make adjustments to white balance, you can make adjustments to contrast, saturation, uh, and it gives you a little bit more artistic freedom. So the RAW file hasn't done any of these things, so the RAW file is not really intended to be a final product. You need to add some saturation adjustments, some contrast adjustments to make it look good, to make it look more like what you saw with your eye. So being able to edit the RAW file and have that additional editing leeway is going to make sure that there's more image quality in the final image, and it just gives you that little bit more artistic flexibility when you're processing the file. So if you're very comfortable with your raw editing, you don't need the JPEG, uh, then just shoot raw like I do. Perfect. Okay, great, fantastic. 
All right, zooming back. There we go. I'm, I'm adding <laughs> some special effects. So uh, another thing that the Puna is famous for are these giant salt pans. And you actually probably have seen these sort of salt pan pictures more from Bolivia. The desert there, a lot of people go to photograph the desert when it's flooded. These salt pans, they get a thin layer of water on them every year. And it's a really amazing thing. Well, Argentina has got the same thing. It's all, pretty much almost identical to what you can find in Bolivia. It's just a little bit less famous. Um, and this is uh, the salt pan when it was dry. Uh, I haven't been there when it's been flooded, so it really is, uh, you have to be there at the right time of year. It's usually during the winter, I think, that the salt pans will flood there. But these salt pans are interesting because after the flooding subsides, you get all these interesting formations in the salt. So I found these interesting hexagons and in some uh, briny pools that were in the salt. And I set up a composition and I waited for the sun to rise in the background. And the moment that the sun peaked out was when I triggered the shutter. So I had a little bit of light just gracing the top of the salt ridges, just gilding the lily there. And that was the moment that I chose to take the picture. It was also when I was gonna get the best sun star in the background. As the sun gets higher, it gets much brighter, uh, much more intense, uh, and you end up getting a lot of lens flare as a problem. So here I had the sun partially blocked. So it allowed me to capture that sun star without getting lens flare that was gonna ruin the image quality. And this is back to the pumice stone field. Once again, this is one of those pumice stone formations coming out of the black sand. So I spent a lot of time looking for really interesting formations and then keeping my fingers crossed that I'll find a good composition and have some interesting sky behind it. So I got lucky here. I got some very, very dramatic stormy clouds in the background. Uh, it was a little too overcast for any sunlight to come through. So I wasn't getting any sunrise or sunset color in this particular shot, but I did get some great stormy clouds. I went very wide with my wide angle zoom. So I had a bunch of these cloud shapes coming out of the edges and corners of the image, mirroring the radial pattern of the ripples in the sand around this uh, rock formation. So bringing together the compositional shapes from the landscape uh, and having them work together with shapes in the sky is something I'm always trying to do. This is uh, back to the Red Desert um, outside of Toler Grande, the, uh, the Labyrinth Desert or the Devil's Desert, take your pick, all three. Uh, and this is some of the, this is why they call it the Red Desert. There's all these red hills and I photographed this with a short telephoto zoom, a 70 to 200. And I was just watching the interplay of shadow and light on these hills as the sun was breaking through the clouds. Once again, uh, the clouds in the background in the sky are the icing on the cake here. I've got these layers going up from the bottom of the sandstone hills. And then the clouds form the top final layer, uh, which is the end for the viewer's visual journey in the composition. This is back to the pumice stone field. You can tell that the pumice stone field is one of my favorite places to photograph. I just love all the black sand, all the ripples in the sand leading to these dramatic white pumice uh, stone features. And so this, I had a stormy sky. I had some nice ripples in the foreground. I got low and close with my wide angle lens. And then the sun broke out and I got some light on the pumice stones in the background. And the warm, colorful light on the pumice stones turned them yellow, which contrasts really nicely with the shadowed storm clouds in the sky above, which end up looking blue. So bringing those two colors together, those, those opposite colors, what's known in art as complementary colors uh, really creates a stark and dramatic effect in this photo. This is uh, another formation in our salt pan formation. Uh, and there's actually three geothermal pools here called the Ojos de Mar. Uh, the pools of the sea, I think that's what it means. Once again, bad at Spanish, sorry. <laughs> uh, but it's a, a kind of a neat area. These, you have these geothermal springs bubbling up every now and then in the Puna. And so here I was able to get low and close with my wide angle lens uh, using the salt formations as a foreground. I've got sunset light on the mountain in the background. And then once again, the dramatic storm clouds in the sky helps complete the composition, tie the shapes in the foreground together with the shapes of the clouds. And well, it looks like we have reached the end. So, all right. That's the Puna, just a small taste of this very 
dramatic uh, area in the Argentina desert. So I'm going to be photographing in the Puna for about a week, and then I'm going to drive a few hundred miles south. So I'll be technically leaving the Puna region, I think, but it'll still be in the same sort of high altitude desert area in Argentina. So the scenery is going to be very, very similar where I'm going to watch, hopefully watch, the total solar eclipse on July 2nd. So you'll know on July 4th when I get back whether I got the shot or not. So hopefully I got it. All, All right. right. Let's see if we have any more questions. I'm we do have water. some more some more general questions mm. here. Um, one of the first ones uh, that we got from Felix earlier on is when photographing a total solar eclipse, yeah. what gear is needed and what focal length do you suggest using? Well, okay, so when I photographed the Tolar Solar Eclipse a few years ago in Wyoming, I set up two shots. So first of all, you're going to need a pair of eclipse glasses. Uh, these are glasses that allow you to look at the sun as the sun is moving into totality. Uh, so these are basically glasses with very, very thick neutral density filtration on the top of them. So you can do that thing that your mother told you never to do. You can stare at the sun. Uh, so that's a useful thing. You won't need them during the actual full eclipse, but you will need them until the very moment that the sun disappears behind the moon. Because even when only like 1% of the sun is visible, it looks almost completely like a normal sun to our eyes. So you can burn your eyes uh, staring at the sun with even just 1%. So it isn't until the sun completely disappears behind the moon that you can safely look at the eclipse without your eclipse glasses. So when I was there, I actually set up two different shots. I had a one camera with a wide angle lens. It was a super wide 11 millimeter lens. So I could capture the foreground below, which was a rushing stream. I, I don't have this picture with me, unfortunately. And then the eclipse was in the sky. Now, the eclipse in Wyoming, the, I think it was 2017, uh, happened in the middle of the day. So the sun was very high in the sky. The eclipse in Argentina, is going to be about an hour before sunset. So the sun's going to be very low in the sky relative to the eclipse I, I, I viewed in 2017. So uh, this is going to give me uh, different opportunities. So back in 2017, I had the super wide angle shot to capture a wide angle view of the landscape with the eclipse uh, as a small feature of the overall composition. And when those exposures were running, I had a second camera with a 400 millimeter lens and a 2x converter, so I was shooting with the equivalent of an 800 millimeter lens on a full frame camera, uh, and I was using that to take pictures of the eclipse itself, just kind of tight telephoto compositions. So having at least uh, 800 millimeters equivalent, so if you've got a crop sensor camera uh, and you're shooting with, say, a 600 millimeter lens and you've got a 1.5x crop on your camera, uh, that is going to be very tight. That's going to be like 900 millimeters. 800, 900 millimeters, 1,000 millimeters will allow you to zoom in to get that tight portrait of the eclipse itself. But once again, what equipment you need to have depends on uh, what kind of shot you're planning on taking. So if you're just planning on taking a telephoto shot, you're going to want to have that long telephoto lens. But you can do wider angle shots that incorporate parts of the landscape. The key thing to keep in mind with the eclipse is that when the eclipse happens, suddenly everything gets a lot darker. And so you might need to bump up your ISO if you're hand holding a shot to make sure you get a, a sharp shot. Uh, I found that for my wide angle shot, I was shooting at uh, ISO 100 and I had like F11 for depth of field. So I ended up with these like 15 or 20 second exposures. I didn't realize it was gonna get that dark. So I was really surprised when I ended up having these long exposures. And the eclipse only lasts for about two minutes. So you don't wanna get bogged down with like 30 second exposures when you're photographing the eclipse because you're not really gonna get that many shots off. So bumping up your ISO to maybe like ISO 400 or 800 when the eclipse actually happens is probably a pretty good strategy. All right. All right. Phil has a question here. Can Hi, you, Phil. Hey. <laughs> can you ensure the gear that is bought used? I'm nervous about theft while traveling. Uh, well, yeah, so you can insure gear, whether it's new or used, but it depends. I have a professional policy, so I have insurance for my business, and I've got a rider for my equipment. Uh, most people who are not professionals, their equipment's in insured through their homeowner's policy. And if you're doing it through a homeowner's policy, there might be a lot of limitations about uh, what's covered. So it might not cover when you're traveling overseas. It might not cover 
you know, I have an inland and marine policy. So if I'm out on the ocean, I drop my camera in the ocean, it's covered. But for some renters policies or homeowners policies, it's only going to cover you when you're on land. But in theory, you can insure your equipment. Finding someone to actually insure your equipment can often be difficult. I found insurance companies, they just don't like insuring photo gear. Um, I'm not exactly sure why, <laughs> but uh, yes, in theory, you can get it insured. Uh, the best way to avoid theft when you're traveling is to just make sure you've got your gear with you. Uh, so when I fly, I don't check my expensive camera gear. I might put my tripod or something like that in my check luggage, but I carry my gear on with me on the plane, and I just make sure to have it in hand. I leave it in my hotel room, and I leave it secured when I leave. Uh, when I'm going out without my photo equipment, I don't leave it in a vehicle overnight or anything like that. I just keep an eye on things. I have never had anything stolen, and I've traveled to a lot of crazy places around the world. Um, but the bigger risk for me is doing stupid things like dropping my camera in a stream uh, <laughs> because I didn't tighten the knob enough. So. Uh, Hannah is asking, how do you determine the best location and time for taking your photos, especially if you haven't been there previously? Well, okay, so this is, uh, this is something that uh, I wrestle with a lot. It's, uh, you know, planning photo locations can be rather challenging. And usually what I start off with is a little bit of internet research. Uh, and I try to get a feel for the area. I don't really like looking at other serious photographers' photos because as soon as you see, like, a really cool shot from somewhere, then you absolutely feel like you've got to get that shot. And I'd rather have my own personal artistic vision. So I'll look at photos maybe like on Google Images. And most of the photos there are just like tourist snapshots. So you tend not to see a lot of the really serious photographer shots. And I do this just to get a feel for maybe what the scenery looks like. Sometimes I'll look at the satellite view on a mapping program just to try to get a general feel for the area as well. I can look at the, the view from the top down of the scenery and decide, okay, that looks like it's really uh, dramatic scenery. It looks like there's a lot of texture to the landscape. So I might be able to identify some interesting areas. That way I might be able to identify streams or lakes, which I know could be uh, potentially interesting for my photography. But I don't want to do too much pre-planning. Usually I will plan enough to pick a spot that looks interesting. I will try to learn a little bit about it. But then when I'm there on location, I make sure to build an extra time to scout, to explore the area, and to find the things that I think are interesting. So that way I can bring my own personal, unique artistic vision to the scene or subject. So it's very important to me to try not to poison my view of an area with other people's work and to give myself maximum flexibility when I'm there. But the internet, you'll find everything you ever wanted to know on the internet and a lot of things you didn't want to know. So uh, <laughs> it's always a good place to start. As always. Yeah. Uh, we have a question that just came in uh, from Conrad in Las Vegas. Hi, Hi Conrad. Conrad. <laughs> and he is asking, have you tried using the fish eye lens in your landscape photography? Yes, I love my fish eye lens. You know, when I bought my fish eye, I thought it was just going to be a quirky lens that I would take out every now and then. But I actually use it a lot for my landscape photography. And surprisingly enough, I use it for my wildlife photography as well, if I know I'm going to have close encounters with animal species. But for my landscape work, I tend not to use it too much when the horizon is an obvious part of the composition. Because with a fisheye lens, uh, any straight line is going to end up looking curved. And that's what a fisheye does. It bends straight lines, and it makes curvy lines look even more curvy. So I don't use it a lot for your standard grand sweeping landscapes. Where I do tend to use it a lot for my landscape work is when I'm in smaller, confined spaces, like if I'm in a slot canyon or a sea cave or something interesting like that. So I tend to use it more for that kind of work. If you're doing the grand sweeping landscapes outside, the fisheye uh, just tends to look a little obviously fishy. And it can very easily devolve into looking like a fisheye gimmick if you're not careful. So I tend not to look, use it as much for that sort of thing. But yeah, I do love using my fisheye lens. Great. All right. Uh, Richard A. asks, do you, Richard, hello. Hey, do you use a circular polarizer to get such vibrant colors? Ah, so a polarizer filter isn't really going to affect the colors, except in specific circumstances. So what a polarizer is designed to do 
is to remove reflections. Uh, and this is really something that's most useful when you're photographing something like a waterfall or a stream, because anything that's wet is going to reflect a lot. And also foliage, like, you know, autumn leaves or spring leaves, uh, the, the leaves themselves can be waxy, and that's very reflective as well. And if, for example, you're shooting a waterfall, chances are you're going to be shooting it on an overcast day, so you get that nice, even light, and you're not getting any glare or hot spots. The polarizer can really take down the glare that you're going to get on any of those wet rocks around the waterfall. So, you know, what's happening is the water on the rocks is going to be reflecting that gray sky, that overcast sky above you. And so you've got all this gray glare in the scene. The polarizer is designed to remove it. So the polarizer isn't actually going to intensify colors unless the colors are being blocked because the surface is reflective. So uh, wet rocks and a waterfall, uh, you know, for the most part, you're not going to reveal color there. It's just going to darken those wet rocks. But it can make foliage in the spring, in the summer, uh, and in the autumn look more colorful because you're getting rid of that glare on those waxy leaves. So you're revealing more of the native color of the leaves beneath. But a polarizer isn't really going to affect the colors otherwise. So if you're in the desert, for example, and you put the polarizer on, let's say you're shooting colorful sandstone rocks. Those rocks aren't reflecting. There's no glare on the rocks. The polarizer is not going to have any impact whatsoever on the color of those rocks. So it's not actually going to affect the colors for most things that you photograph. Now, one area where it will have a dramatic effect on colors is if you use a polarizer when there's a blue sky in the image. Because uh, the polarizer will remove the reflections in the sky. The sky is actually re reflecting quite a bit. So you spin the polarizer, you can make the, the sky look a lot darker. And a lot of people will use a polarizer to make that blue sky darker and make the clouds pop out more as a result. But you've got to be careful if you're working with a wide angle lens because the effect of a polarizer varies based on your angle from the light source. So if you're shooting at a 90 degree angle from the sun, that's when the polarizer is going to have the most dramatic effect. Well, with a wide angle lens, you're capturing such a wide angle of view by definition, some parts of the scene are going to be farther away from the sun than other parts. So what happens with a wide angle lens when you use a polarizer, you'll see uneven polarization in the sky. So I prefer not to use a polarizer to darken that blue sky. Instead, when I'm in Lightroom, I might go in and select the blues and just make them darker to get that same effect without getting that uneven polarization. So, there's a huge, huge caveat to this. So as I said, a polarizer is designed to remove reflections. But it can be a secret weapon when you want to make the reflections look stronger or more colorful. The best example of this is if you're photographing a rainbow. Now, a rainbow isn't really a reflection. It's technically a refraction. I don't really know the difference. Uh, but they're kind of the same thing. So a refraction is kind of like a reflection. And so the same principles involved. If you see a rainbow in the sky and you spin the polarizer, the rainbow can actually disappear. But if you keep on spinning, when the rainbow reappears, you'll actually notice that it looks stronger and more vibrant. So you can actually use the polarizer to make that reflection look stronger. Now, it's not actually making the, the rainbow itself stronger. What it's doing is it's reducing the glare and the reflection in the scene behind the rainbow. So the rainbow in the sky is, is re refracting at a different angle than the light reflecting from the landscape. So as you spin the polarizer and make the landscape and the part of the sky darker, uh, by removing those reflections, it actually makes that rainbow look like it's stronger. It pops out more. So when you're shooting a rainbow, take out your polarizer, spin it past the point where the rainbow disappears, and you'll find that you can actually make it look much more intense. The same thing is if you know, you're photographing in the autumn. Sometimes I'll go and photograph down by a stream, and I'll have autumn color reflected in the water. You can spin the polarizer around and actually make those reflections look stronger and more vibrant. What, once again, what you're really doing is you're darkening other reflections that are around the colorful reflections and making them look like they're popping out more.
All right. All right. That was a very long answer to a very <laughs> simple question. Well, we've got another one coming your way. All uh, right. Robert Tolson. Hello, Robert. Is asking, with the improvement in Lightroom HDR processing, do you think that ND graduated filters are now redundant in landscape photography? That is a fantastic question, and I think the answer is yes, pretty much. I mean, I personally don't use them anymore. I still have them. Uh, I don't. I almost never carry them with me. The only time I might think of using them is if I... I uh, have a lot of movement in the scene, especially if I'm doing longer exposures. And I know that blending those different files together might be difficult because of that movement. So let's say I'm on the coast, for example, and I'm trying to capture a beautiful sunset, but I want to get that perfect wave coming in. And I, and I know that there's a lot of moving water. It might be hard to blend all those images together if I'm doing multiple exposures uh, and not get a bunch of artifacts resulting from the fact that the water's in different places every time I make the shot. So then a grad might be helpful. But as a general matter, I just don't like the way grads look. It, it's kind of artificial, uh, and it just ends up darkening all the wrong things. Um, you know, I used grads for a long, long time before I switched over to digital and before I started doing exposure blending. So I learned a lot of tricks to try to make the grad look more natural. But I go back and look at the photos that I took using a grad filter and I cringe because uh, you can get much more pleasing, much more natural results with exposure blending if you take the time to learn what you're doing. So the Lightroom Merge to HDR feature is very useful, but it can be tricky if you're trying to blend together exposures where you do have a lot of movement. Uh, and so you really need to learn how to do exposure blending in Photoshop, which means you have to learn layers and masks and a bunch of other complicated things if you really want to get these perfect blends in some of these trickier situations. So if you don't really want to engage in that steep learning curve, then the grads can really come in handy. All right. All right. Paul has a question. Uh, any hints on how to shoot glaciers? He's going to Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. I get this question a lot. And I mean, I don't think there's anything particular about glaciers that I would think makes them different from shooting anything else. You know, it's always a good idea to be looking for interesting compositions, to be waiting for that uh, good light at sunrise and sunset, that really dramatic sky, all the things that I talk about generally for my landscape work. Just one thing to remember, uh, glaciers tend to be pretty bright. Uh, and when you're shooting the glacier, just watch your exposure. Your camera is going to see all that brightness, and it's probably going to try to tone it down. Uh, so it's probably going to underexpose the glacier, so you might need to adjust your exposure, give it a little bit extra exposure to make sure that the glaciers are exposed properly. Just be very careful and ensure that you're not actually overexposing any of those glaciers. You get light on those, uh, those bright uh, white and blue ice formations, and they can very easily go overexposed. If you clip your highlights and you lose detail on them, then the image is not going to look good at all. So just be extra careful to make sure, especially if you're shooting in mixed lighting, where parts of the glacier are in the light, parts are in shadow, just make sure you haven't overexposed any of the brightest parts of the scene, and you should do fine. All right. We have a few questions. I see two in particular that are okay. specific to equipment. Uh, first, Chris is asking, can you suggest a good, affordable lens, Nikon compatible, for landscape photography? Hello, Chris. Uh, thank you for your question. This is the kind of question that I avoid answering because these are sort of specific uh, gear questions. You know, first of all, I'm not really familiar with the Nikon line and Nikon compatible lenses, so I don't have any direct personal experience. And second of all, uh, this is something where really it depends on your needs, it depends on your budget, it depends on whether you prefer to have a lighter lens or a heavier lens. There's a lot of variables that come into play. Uh, so it's a little hard for me to actually give you good advice, but since I don't have any familiarity with the Nikon, or very little familiarity with the Nikon line, I'm going to punt on this question uh, and just let, let you all know. I know you're all dying to get like specific gear recommendations, and unfortunately my answer is almost always going to be the same. That's not really an area where I'm comfortable uh, giving those specific recommendations because everyone has different needs, everyone has different budgets, uh, everyone has a different tolerance for, for what they require you know, in terms of quality. So you know, I could recommend something, but not everyone's going to want to go out and you know, spend $3,000 on a five pound lens. Uh, to carry around. So sorry about that, uh, but it's just not an area where I can really help you guys. So uh, if anyone else has any questions about 
specific recommendations for gear, we're probably going to skip those as well. I apologize. All right. Well, we do have a question completely shifting gears. Uh, this is more specific to the stars you were talking oh, about good. earlier. Good. I, so. I, I love shifting gears away yeah. from talking about gear. Everyone wants to talk about gear. I want to talk about the artistic techniques. I it's much more exciting. I did that on purpose. <laughs> Thank you. We have one coming in from okay. Girls Gotta Fly, viewing from YouTube. All right. Fantastic. Um, hello. Hello. And we're asked, why don't you mention the use of a star tracker for longer astro exposures? Well, so I don't mention it just because this is really getting into complex gear uh, so <laughs> maybe a gear question yes. after all <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who don't know a star tracker is a device that you can mount on your tripod that actually will track the stars as they move across the sky and you can mount your camera on this it'll move the whole system so that you can take these really great shots of like distant galaxies and other sorts of features uh, it's not something that's quite as useful. It's, it's great if you want to take pictures of just the stars or of these, you know, using a, using a telescope, taking pictures of, you know, distant galaxies and things like that. But if you're trying to take a landscape photo that has stars in it, the problem with these things is that they track the stars as they're moving, which means during that long exposure, the landscape's going to be shifting. And so the landscape's going to end up being all blurry. So a star tracker is really more useful if you're just trying to take pictures of the stars themselves. But if you want a shot of the landscape with the stars, uh, a star tracker is going to mess everything up. Now, what some photographers do is they'll take a shot of the landscape and then they'll use a star tracker to take these longer exposures of the stars. And the reason they do that is that they can use a lower ISO so they can get cleaner, high quality files. And then they'll blend those in to the landscape shots they've taken. Of course, you know, some photographers don't care about reality at all. They'll just take a picture of an interesting landscape. They'll take a picture of the Milky Way right above them. And then they'll put the Milky Way in, you know, some sort of improbable arc hanging over the landscape features. I see that a lot. As a matter of fact, chances are if you see a really dramatic Milky Way shot on Instagram, it's been uh, photoshopped. So, <laughs> but yeah, that's certainly uh, an option as well is to, is to do that. But yeah, star tracking, star trackers are much more useful uh, for, you know, deep field astronomy type of photos and, and not quite as useful for shots of the landscape with the stars in them. All right. We've got a question from Anna as we're nearing uh, the end of our hour here. All right. Hello, Anna. Hi. Uh, Anna asks, how do you set your focus on the wide angle lens, manual or automatic? And also, what do you focus on or just set at infinity? Once again, <laughs> check out Focusing for Landscape Photography on the OPG shop. This will answer all of your questions related to where to focus in a landscape scene. So as a general rule, you don't want to focus on the thing that's closest to you in your composition. You don't want to focus on the thing that's farthest away because depth of field, when you use a smaller aperture, it extends the apparent zone of sharp focus around your focus point. So stuff in front of your focus point will look like it's sharp and focused. Stuff behind your focus point will look like it's sharp and focused. If you focus at infinity, if you focus at the stuff way, way in the background, then you're wasting depth of field. You've got all that stuff in the background in focus, but that zone of sharp focus isn't going to extend enough to cover your foreground elements. If you focus on the thing that's closest to you, once again, you're wasting a lot of that depth of field, so your foreground is going to be in focus, the background is going to be out of focus. So somewhere in between these two extremes is the optimal focus point. This is called the hyperfocal uh, the hyperfocal distance or the hyperfocus, hyperfocal focus point, or you know, something like that. I, I get it right in my book. <laughs> Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. I just sometimes <laughs> forget the terminology when I'm live. It's really difficult to talk in front of a camera. Let's see you try it sometime. <laughs> um, so this hyperfocal distance is a good rule of thumb that I use is you estimate the distance between your lens and the closest object in the scene. Let's say you've got a wide angle shot and you've got a clump of wildflowers four feet away from you. Well, what you do is you estimate the distance to that foreground, you double that distance and you focus on that point instead. So your hyperfocal distance in this example, instead of four feet away, would be eight feet away. So the flowers are four feet away, you double the distance and you focus on something that's roughly eight feet away, and that's going to give you that hyperfocal distance, that optimal focus point between near and far. And then you need to stop down to use a smaller aperture like f11 or f16 to extend that depth of field to cover the flowers in the foreground and the mountains in the background. So check out my course, 
focusing for landscape photography. It explains everything. There's an ebook, there's even a video component. When you're done with that, you will understand all this and you'll never, ever, ever have to ask that question again. Oh, Anna is appreciative of your answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th I, pr I appreciate your question. And, yes. uh, you know, I, I end up answering that question probably on average twice every live event. So I think we should probably just do a live event. Every live event should be solely <laughs> focused on focusing for landscape photography. <laughs> we'll just play the video and let you guys figure it out that way. <laughs> uh, we do have one last question. All right. Um, Justin Kreider is asking. Hello, Justin. Hi, Justin. What's the best way to boost my business for getting more clients? <laughs> Uh, your, Maybe we'd end on a change. <laughs> boost, boost your photo business or boost your uh, dry cleaning business? I'm not sure what kind of business <laughs> it is. I'm assuming you mean boost your photo business. Uh, well, that's a that's. I'm not sure I can really answer that uh, with the time that we have remaining. That's a very very uh, complex topic. Uh, it depends on what kind of business you have, and it depends on what kind of clients you're trying to attract. Uh, all I can say is these days I live or die on the internet, so the best thing you can do to boost your photo business is to become a superstar on Instagram with over a million followers. <laughs> and the best way to do that is to take pictures of yourself hanging from the top of a, like a skyscraper, like a selfie as you're hanging from the cliff or the skyscraper, uh, preferably not falling and killing yourself, because that seems to be how most Instagram influencers make it these days. So I'm sorry that I, I can't really answer your question better than that in the time that we have allotted, but that's absolutely the best thing you can do. Please do not go out and try to take a selfie of yourself hanging from the edge of the Grand Canyon. I was just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> no one should ever do that. That's just crazy. I see those pictures on Instagram, and I just cannot imagine why anyone would risk their lives just to get a stupid picture on Instagram. So with that, I think it's time for us to end this live event. The motto of today, the lesson that I hope that you have all learned, is don't do stupid stuff to become famous on Instagram. I'm Ian Plant. I'm Leah Zayner. We'd like to thank Tamron for sponsoring this Gold Live Q&A. And I'd like to thank, not Gold Live Q&A, this is just the live Q&A. Live Q&A. Yes, but it, yes. Was a, it was a golden event. <laughs> and I want to thank all of you for your incredible questions and for supporting us. And for, I'm sure, all of you are laughing at my bad jokes at home. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. We're going to sign off now, but we'll see you next time on OPG Live. Bye. <laughs>